to High Truths on Drugs and Addiction, where national experts bring you facts and answer your questions. I am your host, Dr. Onit Lev, an emergency and addiction doctor who has served at the White House and still practices on the front lines. Right here on High Truths, you will learn from experts, hear stories from the emergency department, and listen to people who have struggled from addiction. Friends, fentanyl is plaguing America. It has infected all illicit drugs, from cocaine to meth, counterfeit pills, and even marijuana. If you are around someone who may be using drugs, you should carry naloxone, the opioid reversal agent. Carrying naloxone for drugs is like carrying an EpiPen for allergies. If you need a prescription for naloxone, you should have one, no questions asked. That is why I am offering a free prescription to anyone who needs one. Come visit me on hightruths.com to learn more about the show, submit a question, or download a free prescription for naloxone. And if you like the show, do me a favor. Give us a five-star review and subscribe. Your stars are very much appreciated and go a long way in supporting the program. This High Truths podcast is sponsored by NMI, the National Marijuana Initiative. NMI strives to dispel misconceptions about marijuana and raise awareness of the issues surrounding the drug so that citizens and policymakers can make well-informed choices regarding marijuana use and regulations. Learn more about NMI at thenmi.org. Hi, everyone. Today, we're going to talk about impaired driving. Everyone is keenly aware about the dangers of drunk driving from alcohol. Kids learn about it in school. There are billboards up, especially during the holiday season. Bars are aware of cutting people off when they've had too much. And friends know about taking away car keys. What about drugged driving? People under the influence of marijuana, methamphetamine, or even prescription drugs. A study in 2019 by the AAA, the American Automobile Association, showed that 70% of respondents would get behind the wheel after using pop. The National Highway Safety Administration's recent survey has some good news and some bad news. The good news is decreasing trend in alcohol used by drivers since 1973. We got the message out about not driving while under the influence of alcohol. The bad news is Drug use amongst fatally injured drivers who were tested for marijuana doubled from 2007 to 2016. Monitoring the Future is an annual survey of high school kids. When high school kids were asked if they would get behind the wheel of a driver who was drinking alcohol, they increasingly said no. They got the message and there is a downward trend in the number of kids who would get behind the wheel in such a situation. Kids know about the DD concept, the designated driver. Ask the same kids about getting behind the wheel of someone who was using pot, and there is an inverse response, an increasing number of kids who are willing to take this risk. Having grown kids who went to high school and college, I've heard that sometimes the DD, the designated driver, may be a DD, a drug driver. States have implemented different marijuana-impaired driving laws. 12 states have zero tolerance laws. Five states have per se laws prohibiting a certain amount of THC in the body, like 0.08 for alcohol. Colorado has a permissible inference law, meaning if THC is found in the blood at five nanogram per milliliter or higher, it is permissible to assume that the driver was under the influence. All other states have under the influence laws that requires the driver to display and prove that they were impaired. With that introduction, let's hear our question from a woman who unfortunately learned about impaired marijuana driving in a very horrific manner. Hi, Dr. Lev. My name is Corinne Gasper, and I am the mother of a daughter who was killed by a medical marijuana impaired driver. She was driving to work one day, and he ran a red light at 82 miles an hour in took my daughter's life. So the reason I'm calling today is I wanted to ask the prosecuting attorney um, if there's anything we can do to stiffen the penalties for these drivers. They seem to get off with very light sentences and 
also anything we can do to increase the compassion of the judges in these cases with the family of the victims. Um, we didn't uh, really feel like we were uh, the victims. We felt like the perpetrator was in our situation. So if you could answer that question, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Corinne. And you do a beautiful job keeping your daughter's memory alive and making a difference in your community about impaired driving. The tragedy of your personal story is not just the senseless loss of Jennifer, but the twisting of the knife in the way that you were treated by the justice system after this terrible, painful loss. To answer your question, I am excited to bring you a prosecutor from Illinois who is a nationally recognized expert and speaker on impaired driving, Jennifer Stefaldi. Jennifer prosecuted tens of thousands of impaired driving cases and received numerous awards for her education, programs, and advocacy in traffic safety. You can learn more about Jennifer on the High Truth show notes. Jennifer Stefaldi, welcome to High Truths. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Love. I appreciate you having me on here. No, it's great. And I've been waiting to talk to you about a very important uh, topic of drug driving. You went to law law school, you became a prosecutor. And how did you get drawn to the work and issue of impaired drivers? Well, um, it's a very complex area of the law. um, And there's just so many nuances to it. And I've heard I've heard a lot of prosecutors say, and I and I believe this that, that you know a DUI case we call them DUIs in Illinois. I'm I'm here in Illinois for driving under the influence. That those are um, can be as difficult and complex to prove as much as a murder case um, because they rely so much on the observations of law enforcement on the cooperation of the defendant driver. And so I really didn't like doing those. And they they are very difficult, and they and they take a lot of training and experience, but. Once I got in there and I started, you know, prosecuting them and kind of learning the ins and outs and, you know, winning a few cases here and there, I actually developed a DUI search warrant program that was unique to Illinois, where we would actually utilize search warrants when people would refuse the chemical test. And once I started doing that, it actually kind of took off and I started um, getting the evidence we needed to prove the impairment. And so that led actually to the job that I have now, which is the Illinois Traffic Safety Resource Prosecutor job. And I just, I honestly, as far as the passion I have, one, I'm a mother um, of a of a 23 year old son, so I, you know, I look at it from that perspective. And also, you know, I'm a member of the community. I want my community to be safe. But then, on top of that, was just all the different, you know, horrible meetings but very touching meetings I had with those who had lost their loved ones from this horrible, horrible crime. And that's exactly what it is. And we've got to start treating it like that in the courtrooms. Unfortunately, we hear uh, what I'm kind of known for is that, well, for the search warrant program, but for the fact that I absolutely hate the A word when it comes to impaired driving and that's accident. There's nothing accidental about DUIs because that intent to hurt somebody is is formed when the person knowingly ingests marijuana or alcohol or some sort of drugs to the point that they are impaired and then they pick up their car keys. So we like to, I always instruct people to look at it as a murder in progress because it's exactly what it is. And it, while it may sound melodramatic, it's not melodramatic if it's one of your loved ones that was hurt or killed by a, by an impaired driver. Well, I think Corinne would really appreciate that. Um, Corinne, um, lost her daughter Jennifer was her name just a beautiful 22 oh. year old girl and the driver uh, um, was considered to using medical marijuana and the judge had a lot of sympathy to him because he had a disease and he was sick and and he got lots of um, considerations and and the victim and her family to this day mourns the daughter of her daughter her of her daughter um, didn't get that. So I'm sure she wishes you were the prosecutor in her daughter's case um, a few years ago. But Corinne asked, what can we do about that? How do we get more compassion for victims of of, um, these murder in progress? And how do we get tougher penalties on these murderers? 
Right. So that's a great question. And my heart goes out to Corinne. That's that's just horrible. It's an unexplainable loss that should never have to occur. And it's the most avoidable crime out there. I mean, it's very easy not to commit this crime, right? Um, so I would encourage people to stay in touch with the victim, victim advocacy groups, you know, such as MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Drivers, and um, you know, and those advocacy groups are growing, of course, with with the problem that we have, um, especially with the the drug driving cases going up, which we're, that's what we're seeing. Um, but also, if if your family or loved one or you are affected by an impaired driver, I would strongly encourage you to immediately contact your state's attorney's office, your prosecuting attorneys, whatever they call them in your area, and make sure you stay in touch with them. Make it very clear that you want to be a part of the process, that you want to be in court with on every court appearance. And the judge will notice that. And if they're, you know, the judge should notice that, I should say, mm -hmm. um, and, and realize that the victim is front and center. Now, you know, the frustrating part about prosecuting cases, one of the frustrating parts is, you know, it seems to be all about the defendant. However, that's when the focus should be on the victim. And I'm so sorry that that didn't that that didn't feel that that was the case for for Corinne and her family, um, because that's at the point where the judge should be saying this is the victim's day in court. And this is when we honor and acknowledge the victim and what they went through. And I mean, the judge still has to, you know, acknowledge and afford and 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 respect the rights of the defendant as far as the process of the sentencing. But when we talk about, you know, what the sentence should be, that should be about the victim. And it should be about, you know, sending a strong message to the community that these impaired driving cases are serious and they should be treated as such. And the, the fact that this individual who murdered uh, her, her daughter um, was on medical marijuana should have absolutely no bearing because medical marijuana is just as dangerous as recreational marijuana. And just because he had a medical card or, or whatever they use in, the, in that state for that individual did not entitle him to get behind the wheel and put people at risk. You know, it's no different than if I had, you know, surgery and I took too many oxys afterwards for pain or something to that effect. That's a responsibility that is on the person. Driving is is a privilege. It's not a right. And we need to put traffic safety and victims at the forefront. Um, but these special or the special interest groups, you know, the 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 victim advocacy groups, they are a very strong lobbying force um, with the legislators. And that's how you can get the laws changed is to push for that kind of thing. Yeah, you know, as an emergency physician, if I give you a little fentanyl for a procedure or a medicine like that, you can't drive home. We make sure because then then it's on us if you get in a car accident. Um, so uh, I, I really love what you have to say. It doesn't matter whether it's medical marijuana or recreational marijuana. Frankly, it doesn't matter if it's alcohol, marijuana, Xanax or your pain pills. If you're impaired, if you if you're need that, then you shouldn't get behind the car. Correct. Behind the wheel. Um, but what does um, driving high on marijuana looks like? Uh, is it like the Cheech and Chan movies or or what are you seeing, um, you know, at, at your end of of people who are driving high? Sure. So we and that's a great question. Um, in Illinois, we went with we call it decriminalizing it. The, the, those of us who have some strong feelings about, you know, the, the safety behind the wheel, we don't call it legalizing it because we know that it's really just about money. So we talk about the decriminalization of marijuana in our state. And that happened January 1st of 2020. Uh, dispensaries went up really quick, three in my town alone. Um, and I live in a small town, there's only 40,000 people and they, they had three dispensaries up in no time. So, you know, back in the day, we would think of, you know, somebody as being um, in that Cheech and Chong state, right? You know, just kind of slowed way down and, and just chill and driving real slow, maybe stop at a green light and not go, something like that. Well, unfortunately, Doctor, what we're seeing is really the opposite of that. And I attribute that largely to the potency levels um, in the marijuana. What we're seeing is, you know, from back in the, I'm going to call it the Woodstock era, where, you know, if somebody got a hold of some marijuana back then, it they would be excited if their marijuana had a 10% potency level to it. Now, 
um, the dispensaries, and I, I know that it was happening a lot in Colorado, they're actually competing with each other to see who can produce the highest potency levels of marijuana. And you can get, if you start getting into the waxes and the oils and the concentrates and not just the flour, um, you know, the flour that you typically think of somebody smoking a joint, but you get into those waxes and concentrates and you see stuff up in the 90s of the 90% pure potency. And when you get that, what you have is a completely different effect. You're not looking at that Cheech and Chong, uh, for lack of a better phrase, um, type of high that that we're so used to, you know, looking at what, we, what we're seeing, what's being reported to us through law enforcement is that it looks much more like somebody under the influence of PCP. And it will actually cause them to go into almost a psychotic state of hallucinating, thinking somebody's after them. And when we hear, you know, oh, you can't, you know, overdose or die from, you know, too much marijuana. The truth is you can. A case out of Colorado where a man, um, I don't remember if it was edibles or if he vaped it or something, but he had gotten himself so high that he thought his wife and children were demons and he stabbed them to death. And this was a law-abiding, you know, good, upstanding citizen. Um, we had another, um, there was another case in Colorado, and I'm familiar with, I think her name is Laura Stack. I've actually got uh, a book from her about her son's plight where he, Johnny's Johnny's ambassadors. Laura's. That's correct. Where yeah. he threw himself off the top of a parking garage. Um, so it's it's really become such a different look. And, and I think one of the biggest challenges is training law enforcement enforcement officers to look for that and not have those Cheech and Chong goggles on or not have beer goggles on because impairment is impairment is impairment. Just like you said, it doesn't matter if it's oxys, alcohol, cannabis, whatever it is. Um, you know, the question from my perspective as a traffic safety resource prosecutor is, does this affect this person's ability to operate a vehicle safely? And if it does, they shouldn't be behind the wheel. That's it. If they want to sit at their house and get drunk or high or pop their oxys, you can call it a victimless thing. I don't necessarily agree with that. But once they pick up those car keys, now all those innocent people on the roadway are at risk. Absolutely. And you know what? You, you We just talked in a different episode with uh, addiction psychiatrist, Dr. Elizabeth Stout. And she mentioned the high potency that causes severe psychosis. It's what I see in the emergency department where you you see patients who are agitated. It takes, you know, a whole bunch of strong people to to, to hold them down. And they sing, OK, I wonder what they're on. Is it, you know, PCP or meth? And it's it's just like marijuana. It's just yeah. THC. Can that happen? Yes. And then to sh that's just what we're seeing in the emergency department. If I translate to people like that getting behind a wheel, then that's really very scary. And it, I think it should scare everybody. And right. unfortunately, now with the <laughs> pandemic, we're seeing many more cases and a big rise of uh, people driving high um, and impaired. And, and um, you know, I work in a trauma center. I've had patients who come in in a, in a motor vehicle collision, not an accident. And, Thank you. Um, and I could smell I could smell the pot through my N95 and extra masks and, and thinking, you know, if it was alcohol, if someone smelled alcohol, we'd have law enforcement there and, you know, doing blood work and, you know, filing a DUI. And when everyone can smell pot, there's not that same reaction. Why is that? Well, I think, you know, without knowing exactly what's going on in, in each individual case, I think a lot of it is um, officers lack the training that they need to um, effectively investigate these cases. And the other thing is, is there's such there's so many myths out there about marijuana and it's just not taken seriously. I mean, when you look at the fact that we've given marijuana its own holiday, you know, 420, everybody lights up at 420 in the afternoon on April 20th and they make such a big joke about it that it's hard to to get folks to take that seriously. And I think too, you know, as far as like a, you know, common myth or misperception is, you know, I drive better high. Well, we know that's not bore out by the statistics and the traffic fatalities. That's, that's certainly not true. Um, so I think a lot of it has to do with training. A lot of it has to do with the fact that we've had years, decades to wrap our heads around the alcohol message. 
you know, and, and we know, you know, buzz driving is drunk driving. Um, we see all the different infomercials out there. We have, we even have the liquor, um, the, the different liquor organizations behind us, like responsibility.org, you know, those are, those are great groups because they recognize that they want, you know, to sell their product and, and to make it appealing to people, but they also care about responsive, being responsible. Unfortunately, there's not been a partnership yet that I'm aware of, and we're trying to work on that here in Illinois between the cannabis industry and driving. Um, we had, and I'm on an impaired driving task force committee here in Illinois, and we had a woman from a dispensary um, come and speak to our group. And we had, you know, our, our victim advocacy groups in there. And we asked the person at the dispensary, you know, what type of warnings are given to, you know, your, your um, consumers when they come in and your customers and, you know, do you tell them like, look, this can affect your ability to drive anything like that. Do you caution them at all? And she said, no, she said, the only thing we tell them is to not uh, smoke this product on our premises and that's it. So they're, they're only worried about that. Um, so there's definitely a huge disconnect. We've also seen too, where the um, ride share industry has really partnered up with the liquor industry. We need to have that happen for uh, the cannabis industry as well. Yeah. And you, you were, we were chatting, you told me that, you know, you take uh, Uber or Lyft and you ask uh, the driver whether they pick up, uh, you know, customers who've been drunk and they say, oh yeah. Right. And, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, and then you ask them about, well, do you pick up people who are high and what do they say? Oh, they just look at me like, what? No. Why, why would we do that? You know? Yeah. And I actually, um, sadly, I was at a conference in Washington, DC and a group of us went out to, um, the, the baseball game and we, it was a bunch of cops and I drug recognition experts and I, um, we ordered a Uber or Lyft driver back to the hotel. So we didn't, we didn't have a rental car and we got in and our driver was high. Oh. Um, and I was like, okay, we need to get out of this car. Like now you could smell the marijuana just emanating out of the car. Wow. And she was driving in circles around the block. And I was like, well, let's get out. We've got DUI cops right here in the car. The irony of that, right? DUI yeah. cops in a drug. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. And, and they were way outside their jurisdiction. But um, I believe the one who ordered the, dri the driver um, ended up reporting her. But still, you know, how, how frightening. That is frightening. And the right yeah. thing. So definitely a disconnect there. I just think we're so far behind and there, there's this idea because it's natural and, you know, you can grow it. It can't be bad for you. And so what's the harm if you indulge in it, you know, but we're starting to see, you know, there's a lot of harm that, especially over long-term use. And then my, again, my specialty is behind the wheel. Yeah. Um, what about, well, first of all, you mentioned DRE, uh, uh, Tell us what that is and why can't every police officer be trained to um, notice drunk, drunk, drunk or drug, whether it's alcohol, or whether it's any other drug? Right. Why is there a difference? Why can't they both be able to to be trained to do the same thing? Yeah. So the DRE program is the Drug Recognition Expert Program, and that actually came out of California in the late 70s. And it it, it came from. Um, some officers, I think with the LAPD, where they started seeing, you know, they were using the breath tests and they were like, well, these people, people are blowing triple zeros, but we're seeing all this impairment, what's going on? And so they de slowly developed this drug recognition expert program. And it's, uh, it's based, it, it's, it's kind of hard to explain, but it's essentially the highest level um, of drug driving training that an officer can have. And it's very intense. And so the idea that every officer should become a DRE just doesn't fly um, because it's, it's, uh, it consists of at least two weeks of training and then there's certifications and there's tests. I mean, it's, it's very labor intensive and not everybody's cut out to be a drug recognition expert. Um, and they do a 12 step evaluation process. It's really quite fascinating. Um, if you ever have a chance to have a, a DRE on your program, on your podcast, I would strongly recommend it. I know California, every state has um, quite a few DREs, not probably as many as we need, 
Um, and certainly Illinois doesn't have as many as we need, but um, they're becoming more and more popular. Now, there is a lower level of training that an officer can get um, called the Advanced Roadside Impaired Driving Enforcement Training, and that's a two-day class, and it's kind of an introduction to the DRE program. And so, you know, we're trying to get out there and get as many officers trained in A-Ride, Advanced Roadside Impaired Driving Enforcement, so they can at least recognize drug driving impairment. Those officers, when they're done with the training, are are able to testify that they know that somebody's under the influence of some sort of drug. Drug recognition experts, on the other hand, can go, if they can do the whole 12 steps of their evaluation, they can go so far as to say what drug category the person's under the influence of based on common indicators that they're seeing. And a lot of it has to do with the eyes. They do, they take a pulse, take a temperature, they take blood pressure, all kinds of things. And the person has to agree to submit to the evaluation also, the subject. But it's a very fascinating program. And so those are the the officers a lot of times that I'm moving around the state training with and, and trying to get that information out there. So the field sobriety tests that people are used to doing, like walking on a straight line on a line, you know, for drunk driving, that doesn't apply to marijuana or any other drugs. And that is the reason you need more training and sophistication in this 12 step program that you mentioned. They they actually do apply. Actually, those those same standardized field sobriety tests can be used. It's again like I train, you know, when I when I help these drug recognition expert um, officers at their different programs, I always emphasize, look, we need to take our beer goggles off. The question is, are they impaired? So the impairment's going to look different on a DUI alcohol case versus a DUI cannabis case, but they're still going to use those same tests. And there's a, a handful of other tests they can use, but they're still going to use those same standard tests to start off their investigation. And so just for an example, like when you're, you you gave the example of the walk the line test, right? Mm -hmm. So in the official uh, name of it is walk and turn. And so they're asked to stand with their you know hands at their side, their feet together. They hold a certain position while they're listening to the instructions. And then the officer will say, take nine heel to toes uh, steps, um, you know, forward. And then they'll demonstrate there's a particular turn you do and nine heel to toes steps back while you're counting out loud hands at your side. Um, so on an alcohol um, impaired driver, what you're going to see, what's likely is more physical difficulties, you know, the stumbling, the the falling, the missing, the heel, the toe steps. With a cannabis impaired driver, you're likely to see a little bit of that, but cannabis appear, impairs somebody more cognitively. So it's going to affect those executive functions of the brain. And so on a cannabis impaired driver, you're going to see more things like they didn't understand the instructions. They can't remember the instructions. A lot of times what will happen is a cannabis impaired driver will get to that ninth step and stop and pause and look back at the officer and say, what was I supposed to do next? Or how many steps was I supposed to take? Because they're going to forget that even though the officer verbally demonstrated and or verbally told them and physically demonstrated, that person's going to have a real difficult time recalling that. So the officers have to look, use those same tests, but look for those other clues or indicators that say, ah, okay, we've got some cognitive impairment going here. Yeah. And um, yeah, because this affects the brain, right? In, 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 in cognition, just exactly like what you said. So is there a blood test or saliva test for marijuana? Um, well, that's, let me address that. The, yeah, let me address the blood test first. So um, there's been a lot of um, controversy about um, the, the saliva test. We'll get to those in a minute. But on the blood test, you know, we always say blood is our best evidence. That's what we have so far. Um, if you ask toxicologists who are familiar with this field of, of cannabis impairment and nanograms, which is the, the unit of measurement they use for measuring the Delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol in the system, um, they'll tell you that actually there's very little to no correlation between a nanogram amount of Delta 9 and like a particular number and impairment. Like we are all looking for that magic, like what's the 0 .08, 0 0.08 equivalent? You know how alcohol, it's 0 .08. What's that uh, equivalent for nanograms? Well, 
Um, Colorado, I think, was one of the first states that went with five nanograms. Unfortunately, Illinois, my state, followed Colorado. But if you talk to some of the most world-renowned scientists like Dr. Marilyn Houston, she is a, an absolute expert on cannabis and its effects on the human body. Um, she'll tell you there's very little correlation between those nanograms and impairment. And the reason why is because cannabis, unlike alcohol, cannabis is lipophilic, which lipo means fat. So cannabis does not like to sit in your bloodstream and hang out. It wants to get out of that bloodstream and move into the fattier parts of your body. And so um, alcohol, on the other hand, is hydrophilic. It'll, it'll be fine hanging out in the, in the bloodstream for a while, right? So with alcohol, if you actually charted somebody once they peaked out on drinking, you'd have a pretty nice linear line, you know, straight line coming down at a particular rate. With cannabis, literally, as they're, let's say for smoking, as they're taking it in, it goes up, 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 up. And the minute they stop, it drops drastically and then kind of levels out. And so you can, you will lose typically 90% of the Delta 9 THC, which is the impairing part of the, one of the impairing parts of the cannabis plant. You'll lose 90% of that in the first 90 minutes after the smoking stops. So does that mean somebody, just because the Delta 9 is out of their bloodstream, that they're not impaired? Not at all. In fact, they say it can be more impairing because now it's crossed from the blood. Guess where it's gone? To the brain. And once it hits that brain, that's when you can be really, really impaired. So I've had toxicologists, there's one particular one in our state that presents with us a lot. She has said really the best indicator, well, first of all, the best indicator of impairment is an officer who's trained to look for it and can articulate it. But as far as any type of scientific test, um, if you've ever had a COVID test, you know, those swabs are like this long, right? And you feel like they're scraping your brain. They said if they could, you know, stick a tweezers up a cannabis user's nose and pluck out a chunk of the brain matter and test that, which obviously is not going to happen, but that would be look at the brain matter. It's going to tell us how much cannabis was in their system as it relates to impairment. So right now, blood is our best pick, but it's not great. Um, unfortunately, again, lack of training judges are, they want to feel comfortable. They don't want to rely just on an officer's observations. They want to feel comfortable with some sort of scientific number to look at. And they're putting a lot of um, stock in these nanogram um, levels and they really shouldn't be. It should all come down to an officer trained to look for an impairment and can articulate that in the courtroom. And that's where we try and get as much training out there. Um, with the oral fluids, the saliva tests, what I have to say about those is that um, they have a long way to go. Um, you know, just like when they started breath tests years and years ago, they used to have people blow into a balloon and they would measure for that. Um, the oral fluids um, have come away so far, um, but they still have a ways to go before I think they will be allowed to be used as evidentiary in the courtroom. Um, they're, they're using them for probable cause, like on the roadside, kind of like a portable breath test, but they're not, um, as I understand it, evidentiary yet. Um, and part of it is, you know, there's a lot of mouth contamination that can occur. And so when you're swabbing somebody's mouth, if you swab this cheek, but not this cheek, are you getting the same thing? What if they ate something sticky that's still stuck to the side of their mouth? You know, um, I've had oral fluid companies tell me they cannot rule out mouth contamination. So that's that's a problem. Uh, the other problem is a lot of their thresholds are very low. I'm sorry, very high. So in other words, before somebody will come up as positive, it has to hit like 25 nanograms. Well, like in Illinois, our nanogram limit is five. So if somebody's at 15, 20 nanograms and a cop relies on this oral fluid swab and goes, oh, well, it shows they're negative. I guess they're okay to drive. And they put them back behind the wheel. They go down the road and they kill somebody. So there, there can be some potential problems with that. Yeah. And like you said, by the time you get the lab drawn, it's probably been 90 minutes and you're down to a level of zero. Um, on, on one hand, on the other hand, if you do test positive for five nanograms, you were a lot more than that 90 minutes ago. Exactly. <laughs> so you were impaired. Um, what about the, the medical or health defense 
that some of these murderers uh, use. Um, you know, the, uh, I think you mentioned a case of somebody who killed a grandmother and children, and uh, they're clearly floridly psychotic. And is that an excuse for driving one? Um, certainly, I don't think it's any excuse. You know, if, you know, just like we talked about before, if you took prescription meds, you still have a responsibility to be smart behind the wheel and you're liable for your actions. Um, the one thing, I'm not sure how it is in other states, but in Illinois, um, our DUI laws are what we call a strict liability offense. In other words, we don't have to prove they had um, what they call it mens rea, like an intent or anything like that. It's, you know, were you impaired and were you behind the wheel? You know, that's it. And so the, you know, those types of defenses wouldn't work if somebody's charged with a, a DUI in Illinois. Um, it may come into effect, like if they have mental health problems, it may come into play at sentencing, but it should not come into effect as far as the provability of the case, if that makes sense. you know. And, and I'm sure Dr. Levis, as you've seen, there's a lot of overlap between the, you know, the drug use world and the mental health problems. And you, you've got drug use that can cause you know, psychosis, drug-induced psychosis, and then you've also got people who already have pre-existing mental conditions, and they'll self-medicate with, with the drug. So it's really hard sometimes to kind of peel the layers of the onion away and see what really is the driving force here. Yeah, I I was called as an expert, and I got to see some police video of a, a, a an impaired driver and the guy was saying oh well you know i have tourette syndrome and yeah i think i have bipolar syndrome mm -hmm. um as he was tweaking um on methamphetamine and couldn't it's exactly what you described they i watched him do the walk and turn test and he could not like what did you say what was i supposed to do again and rambling on talking a mile a minute and you know he was using the defense of you know, having a mental illness, which maybe he had, but that's not an excuse to be impaired from your mental illness, even if he wasn't high on methamphetamines and his level of meth was very high as well. Yeah, I mean, in Illinois, we we have a system where um, if the police find somebody who, you know, let's say somebody crashes their car and the police respond and they rule out, that's the other thing that drug recognition experts can do is rule out medical um, issues that are, they're not doctors, but they have enough training to rule out that there was a medical issue at play. And so, you know, if they figure out that it was in fact a medical issue, they can actually in Illinois send a notice to the Secretary of State's office and the Secretary of State's office will in fact suspend their driver's license for medical reasons because it's, it, again, it comes down to safety. And, you know, if somebody's a severe epileptic and, and doesn't take medications that, you know, sadly, and I'm not trying to pick on anybody, that person shouldn't be behind the wheel. Well, I, I'm required by law as an emergency physician, if somebody has a seizure to report them to the DMV, um, right. or if they have a hypoglycemic episode from being a, a, a diabetic if they're for a risk, if that happens, you know, behind the wheel, I have to, re I, I, otherwise it's my license, but I have to report that. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, great. So challenges. What are some of the challenges on the road and in the courtroom to officers and prosecutors? Well, I think probably the, the biggest challenge is, is debunking those myths, that idea that I'm safe to drive when I'm, you know, when I'm high. And I think a lot of that just comes from education, you know, getting the word out there, like doing a podcast like this. And I think when we can educate people and, and again, get them to remove those beer goggles and, and let them understand that impairment is impairment and it comes in different forms when you take different, you know, different substances, then the real question is, are people safe to drive under this? And the, and the reality is they are not, um, you know, if they're feeling impaired. And um, there was something I was going to mention about that. Oh, I know um, the officers often report to me. I mean, I'm, I'm in contact with officers every day and their reports to me are that just about every single DUI cannabis um, traffic stop starts because the person was speeding excessively. And I'm not talking 
five to 10 miles over, I'm talking, um, you know, 100 miles an hour. Um, there was a, a case that uh, Jennifer Knudsen, who does my job out in Colorado, she had told me about um, where a gentleman was going 134 miles an hour in a 35 mile an hour zone and slammed into the back of the vehicle in front of him and, and killed the people in the vehicle. So we're talking 99 miles an hour over the speed limit. Um, I, I'm familiar with a case when you talked about the, the grandma that, that died with her three grandsons. Um, that individual reportedly was going 114 miles an hour in a 30 mile. So, you know, you're, you're getting these really high speeds with these drugs and especially with cannabis. So, it, um, and actually Jen, Ms. Knudsen, Jennifer Knudsen from Colorado, she told me that um, can't, or, I'm sorry, high speeds are the number one reason for their DUI cannabis stops in the state of Colorado, which and that's flies ex- opposite of what people think. Exactly. People think, oh, you'll just drive slow instead of um, drive fast. And the misconception goes with the potency, right? In the 70s, it was a mellow drug, but now marijuana is not a mellow drug. The high potency stuff is doesn't make you mellow. It makes people psychotic and anxious and ramped up. Um, and um, like, again, it could, be, it could look like methamphetamine or PCP, even though Correct. it's just pot. Um, what can states that have decriminalized marijuana do to deal with the problem of of these uh, traffic crashes? I think the the probably the number one thing they can do is, you know, put money towards law enforcement training. That's probably the best thing they can do. And we need to get our judges and prosecutors trained as well. I'm the only one in Illinois that does this job. I can't cover. We have 102 different states attorneys offices in our in our state. Yeah. And I, I just can't get to all of them. Um, so there needs to be, you know, we have mandatory trainings for so many other things. Why not have mandatory trainings for, you know, impaired driving cases? I mean, at least one person from each state's attorney's office should have to attend um, impaired driving, you know, training. Uh, same with judges. It's it's very frustrating um, in Illinois. And I'm sure this is pretty common across the United States, there's this idea that only judges train other judges. Well, I I understand and I respect that, but who trains that judge, right? We've got to allow folks like drug recognition experts um, or traffic safety resource prosecutors like myself into their inner circle so that we don't have this idea that the person should look like a drunk driver. Um, And I don't even like using that word because it's impaired. We, we should be using, we, should, we need to replace drunk and high with the word impaired. Because when we use the word, even when we use the word drunk, it has this picture associated with it of somebody falling down. Well, typically, if you, um, unless the person, you know, is a brand new drinker, if you took a breathalyzer on somebody who's falling down, you're going to get a really high BAC. Well, most of the states other than Utah, the BAC's limits are only 0.08. So we've got to we've got to stop talking about drunk drivers and high drivers and talk about impairment. That's one of the things I emphasize in my trainings is it's impairment all day long. We need to talk about impairment and are they safe to drive? Those are the two things that we should emphasize. And so hopefully we can keep getting the word out there, keep getting the training out there. You, of course, are doing a great job in you know putting this information out there from a physician's you know. Um, angle, you know, what you're seeing in, in, in the emergency room is it's phenomenal, you know, um, and hopefully people are listening. And then, you know, we need to reach our kids too at a young age. That's the problem that the kids think this is just such a joke. Yeah, um, sad. And that's a sad reality of what's going on. Our, our schools, I think, are really pointed in the wrong direction on, on what's important right now. And I think we should be getting these messages out there a lot earlier and make them a lot stronger about abstaining from this stuff um, because it has long-term effects. And especially when you start talking about the earlier they use or begin use, the more amplified those effects can be those long-term effects. I like that summary. And I would, I would uh, put it in like medical terms, you know, what you just said, prevent, you know, the whole concept of getting behind the wheel of anybody who's impaired on, on drugs in order to prevent things and also treatment, put money into um, um, DRE uh, training and get and, and training of judges. And, and I think that would answer what Corinne was asking for 
um, her daughter's case. You know, if the judge was trained, if, you know, if the people were trained and that, then, you know, she would feel that she at least had some justice in her daughter's death. Do you have any final advice to Corinne Gaspar, who's working in Ohio, to, to create this kind of training and changes? You actually have two of them in Ohio. The one I'm most familiar with is Holly Reese. And you can Google her name and or Google Ohio Traffic Safety Resource Prosecutor. And Holly could probably connect you with some of those special advocacy groups um, where you might be able to push and help for better changes in the law. Um, so I would I would encourage you know her to do that. Um, you know, just in closing, you know, again, I, I try not to judge people for what they choose to do behind closed doors. That's their business. But the minute you pick up those car keys and you get behind the wheel, now you affect everybody. You affect innocent people on the roadways, children. You know, you it's so scary. And it's happening at a, an alarming, increasing rate when we start talking about the DUI drug stuff. Um, so just be careful out there. Be smart. Take advantage of ride share. Um, and and keep keep those kiddos away from this stuff. It is just not. It's not your your grandma's weed. It's not the stuff from Woodstock. It's a whole different ball game, and you do, you just don't even want to get started with it, especially at those potency levels that we're seeing. Yeah, I I want to thank Corinne also. Um, thank you, Corinne, for your question and for your energy. You make your daughter. Jennifer's memory a blessing and you inspire me to continue doing what I'm doing and many others as well. And thank you, Jennifer Safaldi, yeah. for being our high truths expert and for the work that you do and the education you provide and making our roads safer. Um, and uh, this drug driving cases, impaired driving cases are not accidents. They're preventable diseases and, and a public health uh, nuisance um, that's preventable and uh, we need to do better. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to High Truths on Drugs and Addiction, where national experts bring you facts and answer your questions. This week's episode would not be possible without the generous support from our sponsors. A sincere and warm thank you to NMI, the National Marijuana Initiative, striving to dispel misconceptions about marijuana so citizens and policymakers can make well-informed choices. Our producer is Dave Rivas from Davey Boy Productions. I am your host, Dr. Ronit Lev. We hope we brought your day a little bit more high truths. Mm-hmm.